Okay, you can turn in your Bible to Jeremiah chapter 8. We're going to talk today about a pre-trib rapture in the book of Jeremiah in the 8th chapter. I was actually going to do this as a pre-trib rapture moment, but upon studying it and looking at the thing, I thought, you know, really, I need to cover this whole thing verse by verse, the whole chapter, and it's just going to be too big for a pre-trib rapture moment, so I thought I'd turn it into a study. And you say, wow, did you, where'd you get this information from? Did you read it in the commentary? No. Um, did you get some kind of uh, professor with multiple doctorate degrees that that uh, told you about this thing? No. Uh, what was it? Um, a young mother wrote to my wife and I and uh, to the ministry here, and she said, what do you think about this? Is there a pre-trib rapture in this chapter? And ironically, I read it the first time, and I thought, well, there's kind of some interesting things in there, but, you know, eh, eh, I don't really know. And my wife read through it, and she came back, and she was like, wow, that's really something, isn't it? And I said, well, I didn't really see much of anything. She said, well, look at this verse right here. And all of a sudden it's like, bing, light comes on. And I'm like, oh, wow, that is very interesting. And there's some really very unique things in this particular chapter uh, that I'd never seen before. I've been through the Bible a bunch of times now. And the book of Jeremiah is one of my favorite in the Old Testament because, as I said in, in last week's study, um, there's so many things prophetically that line up with what ancient Israel was going through that matches today what America's going through, and the UK and pretty much any other nation out there. Things, when God will bless a nation, and they're doing things right, and then they get away from God, and God starts to warn them, starts to rebuke them for certain things, and that happened to ancient Israel, it's happening today, very much so to, to America. Okay. But let's look here. Jeremiah chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. We'll start out. It says here, At that time, saith the Lord, they shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah, and the bones of his princes, and the bones of the priests, and the bones of the prophets, and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem out of their graves. And they shall spread them before the sun and the moon and all the host of heaven, whom they have loved and whom they have served, after whom they have walked and whom they have sought, and whom they have worshipped, they shall not be gathered nor be buried, they shall be for dung upon the face of the earth. And death shall be chosen rather than life by all the residue of them that remain of this evil family, which remain in all the places whither I have driven them, saith the Lord of hosts. Okay? Now, if you want to keep your hand there, in Jeremiah, we're going to be coming back to Jeremiah chapter 8, if you have a little piece of paper or bookmark or something like that, that you could stick there, you know, because we're going to be coming back here a lot. But very interesting there. You'll see this thing of God is pointing this thing specifically at the nation of Israel. And, of course, the time of Jacob's trouble that's coming that a lot of people falsely call it the Great Tribulation. That's not actually a Bible term. Then shall be Great Tribulation. But the Bible never says this time is called the Great Tribulation. Immediately after, they'll say, well, it says the tribulation. No, it says immediately after the tribulation of those days. That is never used as a title. And that's so important to get because people will use that, that one verse in Matthew 24 immediately after the tribulation and they'll stop. They don't want to keep going because that disproves their stupid little theory that Christians go through the time of Jacob's trouble. See, they'll say, you know, it says immediately after the tribulation. Keep reading, keep quoting of those days. See, there's tribulation right now. That doesn't mean we're in the time of Jacob's trouble. That's very important to understand that. The time of Jacob's trouble, the reason they avoid that title, they avoid it like the plague, is because it clearly identifies what this time period that's coming up, who it's for. Jacob was also called Israel. And you can read about it in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7, is where it talks about the time of Jacob's trouble. And it is clearly about that coming time period. It is the title. Also, you could say, you know, like they talk about Daniel's 70th week. So, this time period that's coming is never called the Great Tribulation. So, it is specifically pointed at the nation of Israel, at the Jewish people, 
Why? Because they're in sin right now. They've rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah. They're living very wickedly. So the Lord is going to correct them one more time, you know, and then before the Millennial Kingdom comes in, before the kingdom that He promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, before He promised, you know, He promised that kingdom to them, that nation that they would have one day with Jesus Christ sitting on the throne, before that can come in, they're going to have to be corrected one last time. Okay, and you're going to see that all throughout this chapter. But you're going to see something happens before this really bad time comes. And that's where it's very interesting in this study. But keep your hand there in Jeremiah chapter 8. We're going to go the whole way back to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9 verses 5 and 6. And notice it said there in Jeremiah 8, verse 3, And death shall be chosen rather than life by all the residue of them that remain of this evil family, which remain in all the places whither I have driven them, saith the Lord of hosts. They will want death rather than life in this future time period that's coming. Look at this. Revelation chapter 9, verse 5, And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but they, that they should be tormented five months, and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion, when he striketh a man. Verse 6. It's talking about these weird locust things. There are two, by the way. Um, the fifth angel, you know. And it says here in verse 6. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it. And shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. Jeremiah 8 verse 3. And death shall be chosen rather than life. Is there a tie-in? Uh-huh. And you see those Jews right now that reject the New Testament, they say, oh, the New Testament was written by the Gentiles and then, you know, a bunch of apostate Jews or whatever else, this Jesus, this fake Christ, you know, our Talmud says such and such about him and whatever else. Those Jews that are doing that right now, when they go into the time of Jacob's trouble, if they don't get saved before the rapture, they go into the time of Jacob's trouble, they're actually going to see the fulfillment of Old Testament scriptures like Jeremiah chapter 8, Back in Revelation chapter 9, verse 6. Jeremiah 8, verse 3, lines up with Revelation 9, verse 6. Perfectly matches. And that's just, you know, one little comparison there. There are hundreds of these. You know, I did a whole sermon on serious warning for the Jewish people you know, about the time of Jacob's trouble and how that the book of Job pictures a Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble who loses everything, including his health. Very interesting. Well, let's go back to Jeremiah chapter 8. I'm going to read verse 4. Okay, it says here, Moreover, thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Shall they fall and not arise? Shall he turn away and not return? Hmm. Go to, keep your hand there, and go to, uh, excuse me, Matthew chapter 24. The infamous Matthew 24. This has got more Christians messed up doctrinally than probably just about any other place in the Bible. Matthew chapter 24, verses 48 through 51. Notice there in, in Jeremiah 8, verse 4, moreover, moreover thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Shall they fall and not arise? Shall he turn away and not return? Okay. Look at this, Matthew chapter 24, verse 48. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So you have a... Jew at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble and he's starting to doubt that Jesus Christ is coming back. And he begins to actually smite his fellow servants and saying, he's not coming, he's not coming. We got to go join with the Antichrist. We got to go join. We got to go back to Jerusalem. You know, I, I want to go back to my family and my friends and everything else. You know, so what? They took the mark. They, they, they worshiped the beast. Who cares? I'm sick and tired of being out here in the wilderness hunted like an animal. I want to go back. I want to quit. You know, that's what's going to happen there. And you see the same thing here in 
Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 4. And you'll see this thing too in Jeremiah and Isaiah as well. A lot of times there will be prophetic references to the time of Jacob's trouble towards the beginning. Sometimes the next verse it'll jump to the end. Sometimes you'll see stuff in the millennial kingdom. It's, it's really kind of an interesting thing. And what's the purpose of it all? The purpose of what's going on here in the Old Testament is they'll believe this. They don't believe here in the New Testament, but they will. You see, it all ties together. And again, you have to think about the miracle of that. Because these two books, you know, a lot of people just seem to think that the whole Bible is written just like by a couple people or something, or one person perhaps or something. It was written by God, but, you know, inspired by God through men. But the fact of the matter is there are hundreds of years of time between Jeremiah and Matthew. You know, many, many hundreds of years. And some of the parts of the Bible, there's, you know, probably a thousand or more years between certain parts and other parts of the Bible. Yet it all ties together. And they weren't walking around carrying a, you know, Old Testament in this hand and flipping through it and, and writing verses that were similar or something like that. Uh, Christians really weren't carrying Bibles until just a few centuries ago. Um, if you had a couple pages, you were very fortunate. All right. Uh, if you had a book or two of the Bible, you know, it was, it was handwritten or whatever else. I mean, you know, the printing press wasn't even invented till the 1500s, you know. So what we have today is not what most Christians, you know, lived with and, and lived under for the majority of church history. So just interesting. But let's go back to Jeremiah chapter 8. Jeremiah chapter 8 verses 5 and 6. Okay, it says here, Why then is this people of Jer Jerusalem slidden back by a perpetual backsliding? They hold fast deceit. They refuse to return. Hmm. Kind of like a lot of the Orthodox Jews today. Yeah. They won't return to the Lord. They're, they're going with their own system and trying to be good and whatever else. and it doesn't work. Verse 6, I hearkened and heard, but they spake not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, what have I done? Everyone turned to his course as the horse rusheth into the battle. Interesting because there's a lot of the brethren out there right now that are saying that sinners can't understand that they're sinners. They just need to believe in Jesus Christ and then they'll understand that they're sinners and that they need to change their life afterwards. Uh, that's not entirely true. Okay, Lost people have an ability to understand. They can't understand the whole Bible, but they can understand that they're sinners before God. They can understand that. And that's why it's talking about here in verse 6. No man repented him of his wickedness. All right, They didn't turn from their that, that wicked life of sin. They just went on and said, I'm not, don't tell me what to do. Don't they preach this gospel to me. Whatever. You know, pretty much like today. You know, People don't want to give up their sin. That's why they don't get saved. And I had a guy tell me the one time, he said, well, you shouldn't tell sinners that they have to give up their sin. That They'll figure that out later. So you lie to them? You just tell them, oh, just believe, you know. Well, am I going to have to give up things? Oh, no, just, just, just forget about all that stuff. Just, just believe in Jesus. Why am I believing in Jesus? I'm not a bad person. Well, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Just believe if you want to go to heaven. It doesn't even make sense. It's ridiculous. That's why I'm so radically against this whole easy believism thing. It's just, it's insane that people believe that way. But let's look at verse 7, and here's where it gets, starts to get interesting. Verse 7, Yea, the stork in the heaven knoweth her appointed times, and the turtle and the crane and the swallow observe the time of their coming, but my people know not the judgment of the Lord. Hmm. Very interesting. I want you to notice that there are four types of birds in there, and they are contrasted with my people. What's that about? Let's look at the four different types of birds. You have first, you have the stork, and it says, knoweth her appointed times. Hmm. The turtle, the crane, and the swallow. So you have four different types of birds. You say, wait a second, Brian, turtle's not a bird. That's a little, you know, amphibious type of little guy. He has a hard shell and he has a head to come to... No, no, no. 
if you read your King James Bible, it's when it says turtle, it's like giving it a, a abbreviated form of turtle dove. All right. I made the mistake early on of thinking that turtle was a turtle and not a turtle dove. No, it's actually a turtle dove. All right. It's just a, a you know, I mean, you see a red-tailed hawk. You don't, a lot of people don't say red-tailed hawk. They say hawk, you know. It's just, a, it's just a shortened version of turtle dove is what's going on there. But four different types of birds. Let's look at some of these birds here in the Bible. We're going to see about some interesting things. First, you have the stork. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 11. Leviticus chapter 11, verse 13. Okay, it says here, And these are they which ye shall have an abomination among the fowls. They shall not be eaten. They are an abomination. The eagle and the osophrage, the osprey, and the osprey and the vulture and the kite after his kind. Every raven after his kind and the owl and the night hawk and the cuckoo and the hawk after his kind. And the little owl and the corn, cormorant and the great owl and the swan and the pelican and the gear eagle and the stork the heron after her kind, and the lapwing, and the bat. Okay, what was I reading to? Yeah, okay, you see it there, verse 19, the stork. All right, now let's look at the other reference, Deuteronomy chapter 14. Deuteronomy 14, verse 11. Deuteronomy 14, verse 11, it says here, Of all clean birds ye shall eat. But these are they which of which ye shall not eat, the eagle, and the osophrage, and the osprey, and the gleed, and the kite, and the vulture after his kind, and every raven after his kind, and the owl, and the night hawk, and the cuckoo, and the hawk after his kind, the little owl, and the great owl, and the swan, and the pelican, and the gear eagle, and the cormorant, and the stork, there it is again, and the heron after her kind, and the lapwing, and the bat. So again, you see the thing there, two different times in the Old Testament, the Jews are told, don't eat the stork. All right? You say, what's the significance then of this thing? The stork is an unclean bird. Okay, I get that. What's, what's the significance of it? Go to next to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. I'm going to show you the significance of this thing, of the stork being in that passage. Everything God writes in His Word, there's a meaning there, okay? And, and how do you usually arrive at that meaning? Well, by comparing Scripture with Scripture, not commentary with commentary. Sometimes commentaries are a help, but if you rely on them things as your source of truth, it's going to be a problem. You know, a lot of people ask, you know, how do you study the Bible? By reading it, okay? By doing word comparisons. That's another way that you can study the Bible. But mostly it's just by reading it. And, and, you know, another thing too, and that is the more sanctified your life is, the more you're giving up sin and things like that, the more the Lord's going to reveal His Word to you. And, of course, do you have a believing spirit when you come to His Word or do you have a critical spirit? Are you looking for errors in the King James Bible? If so, God's not going to reveal things to you. Okay, you have to approach the Bible with a believing spirit. It's very important to get that. Acts chapter 10 Verse 9 it says here, On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air, like a stork, you know. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is, un that is common or unclean, like we just read about back there in the Old Testament. What was Peter? Oh, you say he's a New Testament Christian. Well, yeah, but what was he, you know, before his conversion there, he was an Old Testament saint under the Levitical law. That's what he was. And see, they're making that transition. The book of Acts is a transition book. So you go back to the early part here of the book of Acts, 
there are some things that are going on there that God is transitioning away from the nation of Israel over to now the nation of Israel as well as all the other Gentiles. And that's what's going on right here. But let's continue. Verse 15, And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that called not thou common. Hmm. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius's house, or Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate, and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, was, were lodged there. So he gets called away, you know, and, and he's, he's there going, what on earth does this mean? You know, he didn't quite get it at first. And um, you say, well, is there an application to the thing of meat? I mean, should we take this thing as a spiritual uh, meaning here or as a physical? You know, and the answer to that is yes. <laughs> okay, um, we are not under the Old Testament Levitical law. Even if you are a Jew, you have to understand that now in the New Testament, things changed. You don't have to live under that Levitical law of the Old Testament in terms of what you're eating for meat. You say, prove that. Okay, 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. I'm going to show you here. There is some definite application to the thing of now there's no longer what we would call unclean meats. You know, if you see a stork, in other words, you can eat it. First Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. Notice that which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So you can see there that yes, you can eat any kind of creature. And as I've said in other studies, this does not say every kind of food. I've heard that thing preached from people. They say, if you, if you need to eat candy bars or you need to eat hot dogs and whatever else, you know, junk food, that's fine as long as you pray over it. It does not say that in the text. It says every creature. So if you see a stork and you're hungry and you need to survive, get that stork and eat it. Okay? We're no longer under that Old Testament Levitical law. As Christians today, we don't have to go back under that. You don't have to go back to Leviticus and try to say, I'm not going to eat pork products and I'm not going to eat shrimp or catfish or something like this. You don't need to do that. Now, there is some wisdom to it. You know, I understand that there are some, you know, certain things that, that are not all that healthy for you. There is some wisdom. But don't fall into this trap of trying to go back under that Old Testament. We're not supposed to. But now let's look at Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11, verse 1. We're going to see here what this thing, this vision that God gave to Peter, how the Lord shows this thing to Peter and then, reveals it to him in the context here. Acts chapter 11, verse 1. And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him. Of the circumcision there, meaning the Jews. Okay? Saying, Thou wentest into men uncircumcised, and didst eat with them. You know, like, ugh, you were with those unclean Gentiles, these Gentile dogs? What were you doing? Verse 4, But Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them, saying, I was in the city of Joppa, or Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. A certain vessel uh, descended as it had been a great sheet let down from heaven by four corners, and it came even to me. Upon the which, when I had fastened mine eyes, I considered and saw four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And I heard a voice saying unto me, Arise, Peter, slay and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean hath at any time entered into my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou 
common. And this was done three times, and all were drawn up again uh, into heaven. And behold, immediately there were three men already come unto the house where I was sent from Caesarea unto me. And the Spirit bade me go with them, and nothing doubting. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. And he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and st said unto him, Send men to Joppa, to Joppa, excuse me, I keep saying Joppa, to Joppa, and call for Simon, whose surna surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. Hmm, interesting. And as they began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. And so, for as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Hmm. So what was the vision about? The vision was about these Old Testament Jews looking at the Gentiles as unclean, as uncircumcised, filthy, dirty, ugh, get away. And God says, wait a second, I've cleansed them. I'm washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am a cleansed Gentile. I'm clean now in God's sight. Hmm. So what was a stork before? It would have been an unclean animal to a Jew. What am I right now, according to an Orthodox Jew that has not received Jesus Christ? I would be an unclean animal to them. Mm -hmm. Interesting. There in Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 7, it said, Yea, the stork in the heaven knoweth her appointed times. An unclean animal that's likened to a female, you know, like the bride of Christ. So you have this unclean animal, and she knows her appointed times. And right now the Jews are just like walking around, you know, trying to get the temple rebuilt and whatever else. And they, just, you know, we're hoping that the Messiah comes soon and all this stuff. <laughs> the Messiah, Messiah already came, you know. And the bride of Christ right now, we're going walk around going, I don't know what's, you know, stopping the Lord. I mean, there's some other people that have to be saved. I understand that. But, man, the rapture's got to be any day now. I mean, we're getting so close. It's amazing. And uh, let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm going to read a couple of verses here. Uh, verses 1 through 11. And we're going to, again, we're going to see this thing of the stork knows her, you know, the stork in the heaven knoweth her appointed times. Okay, the stork likened to the Gentiles saved body of Christ. You know, and of course there's Jews in with it too, but you know, the, the Gentile saved body of Christ, we know our appointed time. We'll see this here. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse one. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let, us, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation." For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our, Lord, by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, 
even as also ye do. So right there you see this thing, the stork, the body of Christ, we know our appointed times. Hmm. What about the turtle? Well, the word turtle only appears two times in the King James Bible. The one there in Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 7. And now let's look at the other one. The Song of Solomon. Back to your Old Testament there. Go to the Song of Solomon. Right after Ecclesiastes. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 10 through 13 is what we're going to read. And again, you see here a picture of a king, a Jewish king, and a Gentile bride. She's black. Hmm, interesting. And you see this thing, this love story here in the Song of Solomon. It's a picture of Jesus Christ and his Gentile bride. Very, very interesting. A lot of tie-ins here prophetically. But uh, Jerem or, yeah, Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 10. My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. Hmm. Because interesting how that in Revelation chapter 4, John looks up to heaven and he sees a door open and he hears a voice like a trumpet. You know, the trump of God. He hears it and it says, Come up hither and I will show thee things which must, which must be hereafter. Come up. Here in verse 10 it says, Come away. You know, rise up, my love, my fair one, and Come away. Verse 11. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of the singing of birds is come, and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. The fig tree putteth forth her green figs, and the vine with the tender grape give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. So you see it two times there. And of course, the thing of the fig tree putteth forth her green figs. And in Matthew chapter 24, it talks about the fig tree being reborn. That prophetically is a reference to the nation of Israel. When that fig tree is reborn, now you actually have that generation is not going to pass away till all things are fulfilled. So we are in that time period. I don't know when the rapture is going to happen, but it's not going to be too long from now. It's not going to be another 30, 40, 50 years or something like that. All right. If it goes that far, then the Bible's not true. It's just as simple as that. I mean, we are in that time period right now when Scripture is being fulfilled. Again, the stork should know her appointed times. Um, what about a crane? This is kind of interesting, too. Isaiah 38. Isaiah 38. Isaiah 38, verses 1 through 3. Okay, it says here, In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Um, you know what? I think I have the wrong one. Oh, sorry, I was looking down at the next one. Uh, we actually want verse 14. I was looking down at the next one for swallow. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Isaiah 38, verse 14. Like a crane or a swallow, so did I chatter. I did mourn as a dove. Mine eyes fail with looking upward. Hmm. O Lord, I am oppressed. Undertake for me. Now that's a little bit interesting there too, isn't it? You know, because it's it's interesting too, because uh, back there in the Song of Solomon, she actually says, Arise, my love, my dove, you know, undefiled. She talks about her dove there. And here in verse 14, it says, I did mourn as a dove. Hmm. But uh, mine eyes fail with looking upward. I have been thinking the Lord's going to come back for years now last couple of years. I'm just looking at this world the way things are going and I'm thinking man, you know, when is he coming back? It's got to be sometime soon, you know. Why? Well, because uh, I'm oppressed. Undertake for me. You know, and, and 
the, the way people attack me here on YouTube, whatever, it's not even a, you know, a real issue or whatever, but, you know, it's like we go through so much chemical attack, so much biological attack. I mean, you go out, you're chemtrailed, you high fructose corn syrup and everything at the store and this isn't healthy and that's not healthy and, you know, all the radio frequency and the EMF fields and all the other stuff. It's just like, oh, all right, Lord, can we go now? You know, <laughs> That's the way you feel sometimes, and just like, and and vexation of spirit. I mean, you just go out and you hear. I mean, you know, you'll hear, you know, young children using profanity. You know, I mean, I, uh, you know, I see comments all the time on my videos and people putting profanity and putting all kinds of wacky stuff, and I'm just going, oh, I wish the Lord would come back. Now I know a lot of you feel the same way out there too. It's just. Uh, you know, just to be able to finally have our reunion, you know, our, our the body of Christ just come together up there in the clouds and meeting the Lord in the air is just going to be wonderful. I mean, I look forward to that day, and I hope I never lose sight of that. You know, you shouldn't either, by the way. So you see there a crane. Okay, we've seen the stork being like an, being basically an unclean bird likened to a Gentile Christian in the New Testament that knows her appointed times. We've seen the turtle that says, arise and come up, you know, you know that's in there. You hear the turtle in the springtime. You know, a lot of people, a lot of the brethren seem to think that the rapture was going to happen in the spring or something. I don't know. It's not really setting a date. It's just saying a specific time there. Some people think it's around the Feast of Trumpets and things. There's good arguments there. I can't prove either one definitively from scripture good arguments but i i can i prove it no you know um my stand for when the lord's going to come back is i don't know i hope today <laughs> you know so it is but we saw the stork we saw the turtle we saw the crane what about the swallow the fourth bird psalm 84 now this is the one that's verses one through three that's where i was looking I guess my film crew should, uh, you know, say, cut, let's do another take, you know. Oh, but that's right, I don't have a film crew, you know. <laughs> uh, we don't do things on a very fancy scale here, brethren. I just want to keep it real, okay, and that's what I've always tried to do. I usually don't take more than one or two takes for any video. You get to see all the mess-ups and all the me making a fool of myself and things like that. Because that's what I am. I'm just a regular man that the Lord has decided to put into the ministry, and I'm thankful for that. Psalm 84, verse 1 through 3. How amiable, amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts! My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Amen. Verse 3. Yea, the sparrow hath found an house, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young, even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Very interesting there. The swallow has found a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Notice again the female reference here. Most of these birds have a female reference attached to them, like the bride of Christ. Hmm. Interesting. But this female swallow here finds a nest for herself. You know what a bird will do when they want to find a nest? They'll find a safe place where they can't get hurt. You don't see a bird saying, you know, I think I'm going to make a, a nest right here in the middle of the highway or something. No. I'm going to just, uh, just put my nest here, you know, right beside this little flappy door thing on the pe people's house where the dog and the cat come in and out. Of course not. What do they do? They find a place that's up way up high that no predators can get to them. Hmm. Why? That she, where she may lay her young. You know, if you're saved, you know, you can have spiritual children, people that you've led to the Lord, but even your own children. Wouldn't it be nice to have a safe place for those children? I mean, if you're a saved mom or dad out there, wouldn't it be nice to be able to say, 
honey, the rapture's going to happen soon. You know, you don't have to worry about the CPA trying to come after you because they decide to go after all Christian children, or you don't have to worry about public schooling or you know witchcraft trying to get to you through television and stuff like that, and you know the, through media and whatever else. I mean, go to the store, even go through the children's toy section. There's you know zombie dolls and and witchcraft this, and uh, it's just disgusting. But. It, I just love verse 2 there. My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Wow. <laughs> Talk about a good verse to describe the way I know a lot of you feel right there, uh, right now. I feel the same way. It's just like, oh, I just went out of this place. It's just, it's so vexing. It's so evil. It's just like this world... I mean, there's things to do. There's always work to do. I, I thank the Lord for that. I'm not just sitting around, you know, going, I want God to come back today. I'm not going to do anything. No, there's always stuff to do. And it's, you know, there are good times too. I'm not saying life is miserable. You know, I'm just saying nothing can is going to compare to the thing of actually going and seeing the Lord. I mean, can you imagine what it's going to be like when we actually, you know, we're there in the clouds with the Lord and he takes us and says, okay, everybody, come on, let's go to heaven. And we go and we walk into heaven and we get to see the glory of heaven. Or, you know, I don't, I don't know if we're going to be like, you know, sit down and then we all go and take off and we go to heaven. It could be able to just boom and we'll be there. I don't know, you know, but the point is we're going to get there and we're going to see it like what John saw. And you're going to be walking around going, wow. <laughs> you say, well, what do you think about that? Oh, my soul longs for it. Just to say this wicked, cruel world, just go, bye-bye. <laughs> we'll be back in seven years. You know, you better hope that you're not alive then, you know, or that you get saved. You know, if you've taken the mark of the beast and you're still alive, you're going to have a rough time when we come back down in seven years. You know, you think Christians are bad, narrow-minded now, boy. Whew. <laughs> we come back down for the judgment of the nations. Matthew chapter 25, it's going to be bad. But uh, you say, so what do you think about Jeremiah chapter 8? Let's go back there again. Jeremiah chapter 8, what do I think about it? Well, I think that uh, verse 7 there is a picture of the body of Christ. That we know what the appointed times are. We understand, we're looking and we're going, wow, this is really incredible and stuff. But my people, the people of God, that nation of Israel, the Jewish people, they have no idea. They have no idea what's going on. None. They're still looking for their Messiah. I mean, he's he came here and went. I mean, he's been here, you know, almost 2,000 years ago, you know, in terms of dying on the cross and stuff. He was here over 2,000 years ago, but you know, he's, he's been here and he left and he's coming back again. You know, you missed the first coming, you know, you're going to be looking for the second coming eventually, you know, just incredible. But let's look at verses eight and nine. How do ye say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? Lo, certainly in vain made he it. The pen of the scribes is in vain. The wise men are ashamed, they are dismayed and taken. Lo, they have rejected the word of the Lord and what wisdom is in them. Oh boy. <laughs> I'm going to comment on this one for sure. It is absolutely incredible to me how many people out there attack this book, King James Bible, and you say, okay, then what is God's perfect word? Well, you know, the Greek and the Hebrew. Uh, okay, which edition of which text? And you get basically get them cornered to the point where they say there is no Bible that is perfect. Only the original autographs were inspired. Well, you have a real rough time then. See? And these two verses right here are describing those people. They say that the pen of the scribes is in vain. This, this here is just in vain. This isn't God's perfect word. The NIV is not God's perfect word. The New American Standard, the English Standard Version, New King James, whatever, whatever. None of them are God's perfect word. Well, then what's the point of having it written? The pen of the scribes is in vain. If this isn't God's perfect word, then what are, what are we even reading it for? Why even study the Bible? Why even do anything? If there's no perfect translation out there, if there's no perfect Bible 
available for us today that we can hold in our hands and read and study, if there is no perfect Bible, it's all in vain. Don't waste your time. See, that's what's going on there. And, and you know, again, they're there in the, in the days of Jeremiah. They certainly will be here in the last days. Just incredible. But, uh, and, you know, notice too there, verse 9, it says, they have rejected the word of the Lord and what wisdom is in them. If somebody doesn't believe the King James Bible, they're not wise. They're foolish. But look at verse 10. Therefore will I give their wives unto others and their fields to them that shall inherit them. For every one from the least even unto the greatest is given to covetousness. From the prophet even unto the priest, every one dealeth falsely. There's a nice prophecy for the false converts out there. And, you know, I don't say that somebody that uses a new version is automatically lost and on their way to hell. I don't believe that. But what I do believe is if they are truly saved, God will eventually bring them over to his absolute standard of truth, the King James Bible, if you're an English-speaking Christian. This is the obvious standard of truth. That's why all the new versions compare themselves to it. Okay? They, they even admit to it being the standard with them continuously saying, now, the King James was a good Bible. We felt that there was a need for updating and whatever, whatever. You know, they still do it. It's incredible. This is the standard. Okay, here... And those people that reject this standard, those people that say, I don't want anything to do with the King James Bible, I hate the King James Bible, whatever, I believe they're false converts. Ultimately, I mean, when you have somebody that has heard the truth, now they're no longer innocent, they no longer uh, can say, I never knew that. They've heard it, they've rejected it. At that point in time, I believe that they're a false convert. If God's Holy Spirit is within you, I don't believe that you can totally, completely reject this King James Bible. I mean, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Written word. Written scripture is supposed to be our standard. You know? I mean, it's right there. You know, and, and even the disciples, I can't think, I think it's in John, but we aren't going to go there. I don't have this in my notes. But, you know, they, they talked about to Jesus. They're like, how are you going to reveal yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus is like, through my word. You know? And you reject that word? I don't think you're saved. And what's going to happen to those people? Well, over there, right there in verse 10. After the rapture, it's going to be so horrible. It's going to be a very, very terrible time. And they're going to watch their houses taken and their wives given to others and stuff like that. It's going to be bad. Verse 11. For they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Where did we read that earlier? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3, For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. See how the Bible ties together? Absolutely, it's amazing. Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 12, Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore shall they fall among them that fall, in the time of their visitation, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. I will surely consume them, saith the Lord. There shall be no grapes on the vine, nor figs on the fig tree. There you see the reference to Israel again. And the leaf shall fade, and the things that I have given them shall pass away from them. Now, of course, the whole Bible is given for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. These verses here are doctrinally pointed at the Jews that are going to go into the time of Jacob's trouble, but there's application for the modern-day professing Christians, the people that have not truly been saved, the people that reject absolute truth. They hate absolute truth. They are worldly. They, they like to hear about the world. The world loves them. They love the world. They're false converts. All right? And again, I'm not talking about some brand new Christian just got saved and they're, they're dealing with carnality issues. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about somebody that's been a professing Christian for 10, 20 years or something like that or more, and they still have all these problems and issues and things. And they still hate you for you know preaching the truth. Okay? But very interesting there that they uh, have no guilt or anything about the abominations that they commit. 
It's interesting because in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it talks about God sending strong delusion to people who received not the love of the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Hmm. Interesting. Another tie in there. Look at verse 14. Why do we sit still? Assemble yourselves and let us enter into the defensed cities and let us be silent there. For the Lord our God hath put us to silence and given us water of gall to drink because we have sinned against the Lord. So you have the contrast here. Those people who don't care at all about their sin and they're just like, ah, oh, whatever. I'm not even going to blush about this. Yeah, I'm committing abomination. Who cares? But then you have those that actually do come before God and say, we've sinned against God. That's why this bad stuff's happening. Just like the Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble. Verse 15, we looked for peace, but no good came, and for a time of health, and behold, trouble? Like the time of Jacob's trouble? Yep, you see it there? Okay, verse 16. This is interesting here, too. It says, the snorting of his horses was heard from Dan. The whole land trembled at the sound of the neighing of, the, of his strong ones, for they are come and have devoured the land and all that is in it, the city and those that dwell therein. Is there a reference to a huge army with horses in the future? Keep your hand here in Jeremiah. And we're going to go back to Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9. Revelation 9, verse 16 through 18. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand. And I heard the number of them, 200 million in other words. And thus I saw the horses in the vision and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and brimstone. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three were the third part of men killed by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone, which issued out of their mouths. Very interesting there. Okay, and you say, what is that? You, you know, it's, it's probably a helicopter that's shooting uh, cruise missiles or something. No, I believe it's actually what it is. I believe it's literal there. You say, well, I've never seen a horse with a, you know, head of a lion and tail of a scorpion that has fire coming out of its mouth. Uh, no, but uh, there's no telling what the Lord's going to unleash on this earth after the body of Christ leaves. Um, I think the Lord could create that if he wanted to. So it's going to be very bad. But notice it said there a third part of people are going to be slaughtered at this time. Can you imagine that? One third of all people. And uh, verse 16 there, go back to Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 16 it says, uh, The whole land trembled at the sound of the neighing of his strong ones, for they are come and have devoured the land and all that is in it, the city and those that dwell therein. I think you could probably hear that pretty far off, the sound of 200 million horses coming, a 200 million man army on horseback. You talk about frightening. That would be bad. Verse 17, For behold, I will send... Serpents and cockatrice, serpents, cockatrices among you, uh, which will not be charmed, and they shall bite you, saith the Lord. And again, you can look at Revelation. It talks about you know how the animals are turning on people and stuff like that. I mean, it's going bad. And interestingly, you have literal serpents, but I believe that there's also going to be a lot of figurative serpents. Okay, devils and people that are are you know messed up and things, possessed with devils and whatever. And you're going to have those people. And you're not going to be able to charm them in that time. That time of Jacob's trouble. It's going to be the worst time period ever in history. Very, very bad. And you have a chance to get out of it if you're still you know, here watching this. Um, but uh, let's look at uh, Rev or, excuse me, Jeremiah chapter 8, verses 18 through 19. Okay, it says here, When I would comfort myself against sorrow, my heart is faint in me. Doesn't the Bible talk about men's hearts failing them for fear? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Behold, the voice of 
the cry of the daughter of my people because of them that dwell in a far country is not the Lord in Zion, is not her king in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their graven images and with strange vanities? Interesting because towards the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, the Antichrist actually sets himself up in the temple, the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem, to be worshipped. Hmm. And these Jews at the end are going to be going, we want Jesus Christ to be sitting there. That guy down there, that Antichrist, he's not our king. We want Jesus Christ. Again, you see the tie-in here. It's amazing. But now look at verse 20. This is a very interesting verse. Okay, you have these Jews. They're very clearly in the time of Jacob's trouble. Now look what they say. Verse 20. The harvest is past. The summer is ended and we are not saved. You mean to tell me that there is somebody that leaves before there is a harvest that is past? When these Jews realize what's finally going on, they say the harvest is already past and we weren't saved. Somebody went up before this time period happens. There was a harvest. You say, oh, come on, you're stretching this big time. This is ridiculous. This doesn't prove a pre-trib rapture. Okay, we'll keep your hand there. And we're going to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20 says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. Three parts to the first resurrection. First fruits, harvest, gleaning. Anytime you have a garden, you will have the first fruits that show up, just a couple little ones here and there. Then you have the major harvest where all the crop is ready and it's all coming in. You've got a lot of work to do. And then the gleanings when most of that harvest is done and there's just a few. Okay, The first fruits were when the Lord went up at his resurrection. Matthew chapter 28. Many of the bodies of the saints which slept the rose came into the city, were seen of people. They went up. They didn't go back down into the grave, okay? The second part is going to be the harvest, the church age, right? The third part is going to be there at the end of the millennial kingdom there. You see that in Revelation chapter 20. It talks about that. And some of that stuff, I'll be quite honest with you, I don't understand some of that other stuff. But I know when the harvest is going to be, all right? The harvest is going to be when we have the whole church age, the whole time that the body of Christ has been on the earth, people getting saved that whole way from the book of Acts, the whole way up until the rapture. You're going to have that whole thing there. That's the harvest. And these Jews, back here in Jeremiah chapter 8, you can go back there again. Those Jews, they say, that harvest is past. We didn't get saved. We are not saved. And see, somebody in the time of Jacob's trouble can't be going around saying, I'm saved, I'm a Christian, I don't have to worry about anything. I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. That's over, okay? There are no Christians in the time of Jacob's trouble. That time period has ended, all right? It's just as simple as that. You don't have eternal security in the time of Jacob's trouble. You have to endure to the end, all right? So you cannot say, I am saved and sealed until the day of redemption in the time of Jacob's trouble. You can today, but see, there's a dispensational change, and people can't get that through their thick heads. But there is a dispensational change. Right now, you can't get unsaved, all right? In the time of Jacob's trouble, things will change. If you take the mark of the beast, you worship the beast, you lose your salvation. It's as, it's as simple as that. <laughs> can't get it out. All right, two more verses here, and then we'll, we're done. Verse 21 and 22. For the hurt of the daughter of my people and my hurt, I am black. Astonishment hath taken hold on me. Are they going to be astonished when they see the events of Revelation coming to pass? Oh, yeah. 
Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is, the, is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? They're going, we're supposed to have the king coming. What's, you know, what's going on here? Jesus is supposed to be coming and we need, we need him. We need the physician. We need him to heal our land, to heal what's happened to us here in this time of Jacob's trouble. Is there a pre-trib rapture? Yeah. Is it talked about, spoken of there in Jeremiah chapter 8? Yes, it is. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you have watched this video, if you're watching some of these videos and you don't know for sure if you are saved right now, you still have a chance. You still have a chance to be going out at the harvest, at the rapture. I wouldn't want to be left here on this earth for what's going to come. You say, well, I just need to see proof that the Bible's true. You'll see it in the time of Jacob's trouble, but you aren't going to like it. And if you're too big of a coward to get saved right now when it's easy, it's going to be next to impossible for you to get saved in that time of Jacob's trouble. So, just wanted to do this video very quickly here. Um, have a bunch of work to get to here today, so uh, we're going to close here with a word of prayer real quick. And uh, that'll be that. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you, Lord, for the challenge from your word. I thank you, Lord, for showing the uh, young sister about this thing of Jeremiah chapter 8. Thank you, Lord, for how your word lines up, how the Old Testament ties right in perfectly with the New Testament, Lord. And, and I do pray, Lord, for people out there that are watching this, that if they aren't saved, that they might get saved, Lord, that they might really take action and want to make sure that they escape this horrible time that's coming. And Lord, I do pray for the saints out there that, that uh, they would hold fast, Lord, and, and not give in to this wicked world and, and not follow the course of the world. And and uh, be unfaithful when you show up, Lord, but that they would be faithful and receive a full reward. And I just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, just a quick announcement here. Uh, we do have uh, my in-laws are coming here um, sometime next week, and so that's why I'm kind of rushing here and, and trying to get some things done. Um, please pray for them. Please, as far as I know, they're still not saved and everything. So please continue to pray for them. Um, looking forward to trying to maybe have some chances to witness to them and everything while they're here. And so um, just please keep them in your prayer. Um, I think that's about it for right now. Like I said, i uh, got a lot of things to get done here. So I'm going to cut this one short. Um, but... Uh, some very interesting studies coming up in the future. We will be getting to some of the sermon requests and hopefully getting out to the uh, land a little bit more away from the studio setting here. I do have some more studies to do in here, but you know, just having to deal with the black flies and the mosquitoes and stuff right now. And of course, it's raining like all the time. And, and you know, every time I put together a video, it's like, oh, it's gonna rain the whole way into through the weekend. Usually, you know, I try to put my sermon together Thursday and then record Friday or Thursday evening or Friday so I can have it up by Saturday night. Um, doesn't always work that way. So, because usually the sunny days are like Sunday and then Monday or something. So, kind of makes a problem. But, oh well, we'll work on it. So, that's going to be it for the video. Please keep us in your prayers. Thank you to everybody who's been donating. We, we really do appreciate that. Um, it's just great. So, and, I, and we pray every night for God's blessing to be upon those who donate to the ministry. So thank you. So that will be it. Thank you very much for watching.